sure whether you have been exposed to this before or not. So I'll be starting from the uh, from the very basics. So uh, in case you are already aware, then probably uh, we can go forward with the latter half. Then uh, we take you through an example of how to use this technique to evaluate uh, risk in a portfolio of assets. So the structure is the first uh, look at the different uh, approaches to uncertainty. Monte Carlo simulation is one of the techniques which you use to get a handle on how to handle uncertainty. So just a very briefly we'll just touch on that so that we know where to place Monte Carlo simulation in the different techniques that are available to us. We'll start with the introduction then. Uh, the next section will be when to use and when not to use Monte Carlo simulation. So, Certain situations, it's very helpful to use a Monte Carlo simulation. Certain situations, it's not advisable to use a simulator. So we'll look at those situations. Uh, we look at some impediments to deploying this technique. We look at some benefits and pitfalls. We'll come to our example, second last topic, and then we'll uh, look at some of the recent criticisms of the Monte Carlo simulator. So post the 2008 financial crisis, uh, this technique was uh, severely criticized because most people felt that it was not, you know, ha highlighting all the risks that are there. So we look at some of those criticisms and what's, what's the experts take is on those uh, criticisms. So when we when we think about uncertainty, we can basically divide the different approaches into two halves. One is the non-probabilistic approach to looking at it. The other is a probabilistic approach to looking at uncertainty. So when you look at a non-probabilistic approach, first. Uh, the most basic technique that is used in that is a point estimate. So, uh, say if you if you have if you have a population and uh, so you, you know you are interested in that population but you cannot observe that population. You are interested in some some characteristic of this population. Say that's the parameter. What you have with you is a sample, and uh, so for that sample you compute a statistic and you use this statistic as a best guess as an estimate for the population parameter. That's an example of a point estimate where you're using one value as the best guess for uh, the population parameter. For example, in case I was interested in looking at the what the average height of people are in this room, I can probably take a sample of five people, look at their heights, and then I can infer that for the entire population, the height would be about this. So that's just one estimate that you're using for the population. A probabilistic approach on the other uh, on the other side uses an interval to get a handle on uncertainty. Now there are two aspects to probabilistic approach. One is by giving a range of values, and it's not just sufficient to give a range of values. You also have to specify the likelihood that uh, your observation will fall in that range of values. So we have two approaches, basically non-probabilistic and probabilistic. Uh, the probabilistic approach is considered to be more odd form of looking at uncertainty because it gives you a better idea of what might happen in the future. There are three types of probabilistic approach. Uh, we are all familiar with scenario analysis in which very, very simply what you could do is you can have three scenarios, say best case, worst case, and the normal case, and give a situation under each of these cases. So my take on uncertainty is these three events might happen. And so you can have even multiple scenarios, and uh, so this kind of technique is suitable for basically outcomes in which you know outcomes can be quantified in terms of say maybe ten outcomes or twenty outcomes or uh, whatever outcomes you might decide on. Uh, second is a decision tree. Decision tree is like a scenario analysis, but it takes sequential decisions also into consideration. So say A, you know you take a decision at node A, you go to B. You can again have multiple scenarios for that. You again take a decision, reach a separate node, and then again multiple scenarios. And what a Monte Carlo simulator basically is, is it takes both these and uh, so it's basically a scenario analysis and a decision tree analysis on steroids. It helps you to build multiple scenarios with multiple decisions, and you take the use of uh, a computer to run this. So it, it really uh, takes the best out of both of them, and because it uses a uh, you're basically using a machine, you're using an algorithm to run it. So you can even model continuous outcomes on it, not necessarily just discrete outcomes. 
I just wanted to give a very brief uh, background to this technique, how because this will help us to understand what was the problem that uh, you know the scientists were trying to solve when they stumbled upon a Monte Carlo simulator. Why did they decide to use it, and what was the necessity because of which Monte Carlo simulator was invented? Uh, so these are three scientists, John, Stan, and Nicholas. They were involved in the Manhattan Project. It is a project launched by the US government and with, with participation from Canada and UK with the objective of developing an atomic bomb. Uh, so what, what the scientists, what the problem that they faced was how do you model a very complex chain reaction in highly enriched uranium? So they were looking at this highly enriched uranium and they were trying to get a handle of how the complex reaction would look like. And this the situation was so complicated it was not possible to get a handle on it analytically. So you had a lot of equations, but it was not possible to solve it using algebra. Which is to say you're not able to solve it analytically. Just having a pen and paper and having an equation and solving it. You're not able to do that because it's so complicated. What they thought was that you could use a simulator. So what you know you have your entire complex equation and rather than trying to solve it. What if you assume different values for the variables and observe how the output variable changes? And now the the revolutionary thing about this technique was not that they so if you have say y as a function of a, b, and c, and uh, you know what values a can take, say, and you know what values b can take, and say you know what values c can take. One way of doing this would be that you know you hold b and c constant in a, you take a value, look at the output. Then you change A, you know, so you run across all the values for A, you run, run across all the values for B, then you run across all the values for C. That would have taken, say, this is a simple equation, Y, A, B, and C, it might be very easy to do that, but what if you, you have an equation with, say, 50 variables, and each of those variables is a continuous variable which can take a lot of values, which can, say, take an integer as a value. How do you go about doing that? So, you know, so the revolutionary part of their approach was that Instead of systematically plugging and trying different numbers, what they did was to randomly choose numbers and put it into these equations. So that was their idea. And now it, it was very important that when they are running the simulator, they put in random values because when you put in random values, then you can use different statistical techniques like central limit theorem and other approaches to model your analysis. You can use confidence interval, all of the statistical techniques that you can use depend on a fundamental assumption that your samples are random samples. So this was so this was the first electronic computation of a Monte Carlo simulator. And among those three scientists, uh, the the idea of the birth of Monte Carlo simulator is attributed to Stan. And uh, it's, it's again very interesting how he thought about this idea. And uh, so as he describes, he he, he had a bout of sickness and. He was bedridden for a few days and he was just trying to answer the question of in his bed. Uh, if I if I if I have fifty two, if I have a deck of cards and if I were to lay out that cards on uh, as a canceled solitaire game, I mean, yeah, I'm sure we all have played solitaire. So if you, if I were to lay it out in four foundations and if I were to lay it out in the deck and the tableau, what are the chances that by randomly laying out I will get a successful play? Now one way of looking at this question is you can actually Solve it using probability, but you, you, if you if you play solitaire, you, you know the complexity of trying to mathematically try and get an idea of what is the probability that if I randomly take a deck of cards and if I you know arrange it as a canteen solitaire, that I'll get a successful play. So his idea was what he thought was why not you know uh, a better better way of solving this would be to lay out the cards 100 times and simply observe and count the number of successful plays. So that would be your, your idea, that, that would be your best guess, a probability approach to saying that you know if you do this with this much probability, you'll have a successful game. And the name was, it was, it was called Monte Carlo Simulation, it was named by Nicholas, another scientist that we saw in the Manhattan Project. That's because Stan Sunker would borrow money, go and play at Monte Carlo, which is a famous casino <coughs> in uh, Monaco. So uh, what is Monte Carlo? Simulation. So, it's, it's a technique in which you are characterizing your, all your input variables, which are uncertain, by a probability distribution. And once you define a probability distribution, you use random sampling to pull different values for those inputs, 
run it through your functional relationship and get different values for your output. So, right, so if, if you take an example, say x, y, and z are three input variables, it could be anything, say GDP, inflation, and say foreign investment, and you're trying to look at A, which might be, say, a return on a security. And you have some functional relationship which tells you how these three variables are related to uh, variable A. Uh, it could be anything. It could be x plus y plus z is A, x divided by y plus z. So it's just some functional relationship is there which you know combines these three variables to that. Now instead of using one single point estimate for each of these variables, running it through that relationship and getting the value A, you, you, you pick a distribution for each of these variables. So these distributions are supposed to tell you what values x can take. So uh, these have to be properly fitted to those variables. It should be a good representative of those variables, otherwise your analysis will not show good results. So once you have your input distribution variables, you define a functional relationship. You use random sampling to pick different values from this uh, distribution, and you get A. So because you're, you, you're using multiple inputs, so you'll get a lot of values of output. Again, you can make a histogram of those output and you, that will be your distribution. And then you can use different statistical analysis like a confidence interval and other stuff too. So what, what, what this technique really does is you have uncertainty in model inputs and you have transposed that to uncertainty in your model outputs. Now, what is so Monte Carlo about the about the simulation is any simulation Monte Carlo. Uh, so the, the answer to that is if if, you, if if there's any simulation which relies on random sampling, it's it's a Monte Carlo simulator. Uh, and and the reason why this is the most popular form of simulation is uh, so once you have decided what your input distributions are, those are the subjective assessments which you throw into the model. And uh, so once you have done that, you know, your subjectivity ends there. Uh, so, you know, somebody can question you as to your distribution assumptions are wrong. But nobody can question the simulator in terms of a technique, in terms of randomly generating values from that uh, distribution. So in a Monte Carlo simulator, uh, you know, so you have defined the distributions, then the output that you get is dependent on random sampling. So there is no subjectivity. So it, it meets all the requirements that you know, uh, evaluator might pose in terms of you know, delving any subjectivity in terms of the output. Uh, just to just to compare it with other kinds of simulation, you can have a historical simulation. Say, if you are interested in knowing what what the returns for a particular stock, say X, is going to be over the next year, and say that stock uh, has been in the market for say 15, 20 years, so you can have 15, 20 observations of the annual returns of that stock. And one very simple way of you know, communicating what returns that stock will generate is to look at those 15, 20 observations, which will be sort of your simulated values. So you can say that you know, the next year, my return is going to be between those 15 to 20 annually. That's like what history is telling you. So that's also a simulation. What you're basically done is you have looked at a historical path, and that forms one of the inputs to what an output variable can take. But it's not Monte Carlo simulator because you have not defined a probability distribution and you're not using random sampling. And now the problem with historical simulation, it could be that past is not prologue just because it has happened in the past may not happen in the future. So basically you run across the problem of non-stationary data. If you have any data which changes its behavior across time periods, and if you use historical simulation, then uh, you won't probably get good results because that just that the data series keeps on changing its behavior across time. The other problem with historical simulation is so if you have a lot of historical path in your when you're communicating your output, you're you're assigning all of them an equal probability. This doesn't happen in a Monte Carlo simulator because say I, I characterize a variable as a normal distribution and when I'm picking values from that distribution there's a higher chance of picking values from this part of the distribution, these are the two tails, so there's, there's going to be less values. So you have a way of uh, subjectively telling what, what what do I really expect in this state if it's rainfall and you observe that for the past 50 years, 10, 10 centimeters of rainfall is has been observed. So when you're, when you're modeling rainfall, it makes sense to pitch it as a normal distribution with 10 centimeters as the average. 
that way most of the values will get pulled around 10 centimeters and there's going to be some divergence that those will be your drop gout situation or your really excess rainfall. Now one of the criticisms of the Monte Carlo simulator is okay we're using random sampling and so there might be clustering you know fine you have randomized it but might be just on a random basis you know you had a lot of uh, inputs from this part of the distribution, maybe not from that part of the distribution. But this generally won't be the case if your number of trials in your simulator is really high. If you're doing one million random samples, the probability that there will be some kind of clustering uh, won't be there. But to, to even to uh, you know, solve this kind of uh, problems, you can use, basically you can, there are techniques where you can split the distribution into separate halves and you can randomly sample from this from this, this, so you'll have adequate representation across all the distribution. But then, if you're using this, then again, you know, somebody can push in that there is a lot of subjectivity that you're putting into your tandem sampling. So uh, it depends entirely on you what uh, you want to uh, achieve. Now, uh, when should you use a simulator application for a Monte Carlo simulator? So very, very basically put, if, if something can be solved mathematically, you don't need to use uh, a simulation. Say, if a if a probability of you need to find the probability of heads or tails in the tossing of an unbiased coin, uh, you you know by simple because it's an unbiased coin, you know the number of heads by total number of tossing will be a ratio of one is to two. You can also use a simulator to answer this question. You can have a uniform distribution, take a value from zero to one. If if the value is between 0 to 0 0.5, you can categorize it as head. If it's from 0 0.5 to 1, you can categorize it as tails. And you can do this 1 million times. And what you'll see is, uh, on an average, you'll see very closely, you'll see that half the times it's heads, half the time it's tails. And so just to get the idea across, you know, there was no need for a simulator in this case. Why to go in Excel, build the entire model, run, run it a million times, when you can already figure it out mathematically. In the previous, so, but if you just to get an idea of when you can use a simulation, if if you have a if you have a problem statement like this, which might look like a problem statement that we all face when we come to office, so say you drive three kilometers, there's a probability attached to you that achieve a certain speed. Then you come to an intersection which then has a traffic light. Then you again cross that traffic light. You achieve you go to some other place. You again come at an intersection. You again travel some more. Now if 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 uh, I'm going to give you a pen and paper that asks you to solve this problem mathematically. What, what you will come across is you'll have multiple state variables with 90%, 10%. You use integrals to sum across those multiple state variables. And there are so many different state variables, so many integrals that probably you'll find it very, very difficult to get an answer to this mathematically. If you're trying to get an idea of 75% you know, probability that I'll arrive to work on time. But this kind of this kind of a problem can be solved very conveniently with the help of a of a simulator. Just to give you an idea of when to use Monte Carlo simulator, if it is not possible to solve mathematically the functional relationship between input and output, you should use a simulator. The other thing is, if you cannot, so say you have uh, some variable, say A, related with some ten other variables. Uh, if it's a very simple relationship, if A plus B plus C plus B plus E, and all of them are normally distributed, you know that output variable will also be normally distributed. So in this case, you can work out what the distribution of the output variable will be based on what your input variable distribution is. But not all situations will have a very simple mathematical relationship like this. So situations in which you cannot get a handle of what kind of output distribution I will get, those are situations you should use a simulator. And you should use a simulator when there are complex interactions because it becomes very difficult to handle these situations mathematically. So in, in, in one line, you should calculate when you can, can and you should simulate when you cannot calculate. The steps behind a Monte Carlo simulator, the first obviously is you select the variables, which is the input and the output variable. And the second part is the, the most difficult part and this is also the part where your analysis will be criticized the most. It's how do you specify a distribution to model the kind of output which your variables can take. 
So there are different ways to look at this. Say, say just to take another example of the rainfall. If you have, if one of your inputs are is rainfall, so you might have historical data for rainfall. You know, you can you can take it in Excel. You can build a histogram. You can look at what the pattern has been, and you will get an idea of what kind of distribution it follows. And hence, you can specify approximately some probability distribution behind it. If historical data is not there, you can use cross-sectional data. But if if there is no data, then you you'll have to intuitively look at the variable, understand the variable, and pick some uh, distribution which you think closely resembles the behavior of that variable. Uh, once you have picked your probability distribution, you can randomly sample from that, run it past your model to get the output. And then analyze the distribution of the output variable. Uh, in in mostly all the literatures on the Monte Carlo simulator, there are two impediments which are highlighted again and again. It's again, how do you really go about? So an example would be: it's very easy to say, say, say if it's, it's about GDP, it's easy to say I expect the growth rate of GDP over the next five years to hover around eight percent. But it's it, it might be difficult for you to tell what what what's the distribution of GDP you expect over the next five years. So, because it's just not telling that okay, it will follow a normal distribution. It's also specifying the parameters of that. So, for a normal distribution, you have to specify the mean and the standard deviation. Uh, the other impediment is uh, that a simulation it can be time and resource intensive. So, if you if you have a model, say with 15, 20 variables, and if you're running it. Uh, Maybe a million times, it will take up a lot of time on, on Excel. You just, you just have to leave your machine and also the mod, the, the building the model behind that process can also be very resource intensive. But the benefits, obviously, when you are struck against a complicated mathematical dilemma, you don't need to really bother how to get across this. You can simulate and get an idea of what the output will look like. The other benefit is okay, now this is obviously. The, most important benefit of a Monte Carlo simulator. Now, I, I just don't, uh, you know, when, when I'm looking at uncertainty, when I'm looking at a variable, uh, I, I get an entire distribution for that variable. So, in a way, it's like you know, you're getting a window as to what are all the possible values that that variable can take. Not only that, but all the possible values, you also have an associated probability with each of those values, which is the biggest value add. So, uh, the pitfall is, is obviously it's a it, it can be a garbage in, garbage out model. If, if the distributions are not specified, then the output you will get will be garbage. Uh, the other is obviously it, it, a, a multi color simulator allows you to get a handle on uncertainty, but if you misuse the technique, then the benefit that you get out of having, a, say, even a fuller distribution might be offset by just having a wrong distribution. Um, so let's, uh, let's look at an example of. Uh, how you can use this technique to evaluate risk in a portfolio of assets. So uh, I'll be explaining here, but here I've just given this just to first understand why to even use this technique. So if if, if you must be familiar with value at risk. So say if you have an if you have an asset which you know the distribution, say it's a normally distributed value, and uh, say it has a mean and a standard deviation. And because we have assumed normality, we know that uh, all the 95% of the observations in a normal distribution will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So you, you can easily say that I can say 95% confidence that the asset. In case it's a, it's a portfolio of assets. Again, if you assume normality and uh, you assume that all the assets follow a normal distribution, the value of those assets. Uh, but so the, the return, say for a three asset, the return will be simply the return of, of each of those assets weighted by their uh, proportion in the investment. But if you want to get an idea about the variance in, and in case those assets are related, which is most often the case in financial markets, you'll have to estimate covariances. So, uh, so for 10 assets, the number of covariances will be 10 C2, 10 combination 2. There will be 45 covariances which you have to estimate. Uh, and you know this is for a 3 asset, the variance for a 10 asset, there's going to be 45 such 
covariance okay so it becomes extremely complicated to try and get an idea about risk in a portfolio of assets in which you know all of them are may, may have some kind of correlation and so the structure that uh, we'll be looking at is say say you have 10 10 bonds and uh, you're combining it into a structure and does that that structure has some cost it will receive interest from these bonds it pay out some interest to the investors. It will have some repayments, principal repayments from here. It will do some reinvestments, and so a lot of things happening here. And finally, the investor gets some return. Uh, capital guys will obviously see how similar this structure is to a securitization transaction, or, or, or how similar this is to a CDO structure, where the combining bonds into a structure and. So obviously, in a, in a CTO, in, in the case of securitization, we can also define a waterfall here. So you'll have multiple investor returns given uh, the different branches that they subscribe. Now, if you if you look at this uh, structure and you try to understand how, and say for each of these bonds, bonds one to bond ten, so you have the tenure, so you can you, know, look, you, you have the ratings, so you can you can get so you can get a the, the cumulative default probability for each of those bonds, you, you can have that. Now, how how do you communicate to an investor? Say if say if bond one has a probability of default of fifteen percent, bond two has some probability of default, and you have combined it in that structure. The the question is how do I communicate to an investor what kind of returns you will get? Now, say you know in this structure you. Know, Across, say it's a five-year structure. Some bond will be going bust. That say that that bond goes bust. It affects interest. It affects interest payouts. It affects repayments. It affects reinvestments. There are so many things, so many cash flows happening out here. So the only way to uh, model this kind of situation is through a simulator. And so all the rating agencies, Standard and Poor, Moody's, they all use Monte Carlo simulator to evaluate the. A, a CDO structure. So SMP has an add-in. It's a it's a paid add-in. So obviously we don't have access to it, but it's called the CDO evaluator, in which you, know, you can specify the structure for your CDO. You can specify the different probability of defaults. You can specify correlations. Specify the number of trials. And what it does is it it runs that simulator. And say if you have multiple tranches out here, for each of those tranches, it will calculate what is the default. That, that tranche can withstand before the investors take a hit. So you can assign a rating to it and you can price it. So just in our uh, hypothetical example, say we have bond 1 to bond 10, and say you have a 100 lakh portfolio, and these are the rate of interest for those bonds, and say you have the tenure. So it's, some are 5 year, some are 3 year. Now, say all these bonds are rated and you have their cumulative default property. So, for say for a five year bond, the cumulative default property is 15%. So, in its five year span, there's a out of 100, 15 times this bond goes past. Uh, as a special case, uh, what you can also do is you can use correlation to model a contagion effect in this analysis. So rather than saying that each of these bonds have an uh, independent uh, default, you can say the default for each of these bonds are correlated. So which is very true for say a sector like microfinance where you have a lot of political and regulatory risk. So if, if you see a few MFIs going bust, that's generally a case where a lot of other MFIs might also be going bust. So, we will, when we discuss the results for this, we will we'll look at both uh, independent default and correlated default. So, we will get an idea as to when you use correlated default, how does the result really change if, if I use correlated default versus if I use independent default. So, so you have an idea now, we have, we have an assumption for uh, the default properties for each of those bonds. What you can also do is you can you can randomize the point at which that bond will default. So say if you have bond one and it's a five-year tenure, so you can randomize 
where in that period that bond goes bust. So uh, I think I, I missed the point. So uh, if you have a cumulative default probability, say 15 percent, how do you translate that into a default yes or no uh, binary variable? You can use a uniform distribution, uh, pull a value between 0 and 1, and say if that value comes more than 0 0.85, you can categorize that as a default, and if it's less than 0 0.85, that will be a case of no default. Similarly for the different tenures. So we have we have five year and three year bonds here, but we have also assumed some cumulative default probability for two year and one year. So which is which is when this three year bond matures, this structure will automatically use that principle to reinvest in some other instruments. So it might reinvest in a two year instrument, it might reinvest in a one year instrument. So we also have assumptions for uh, default properties for two year and one year. Now, so again, uh, uh, randomize, uh, randomizing the point of time in the bonds default is again uniform distribution, 0 to 1. If it's, say, if it gives 0 0.33, so you can have the 5 year tenure and you can accordingly map that 0 0.33 to the number of years that has elapsed. Uh, you have to make some assumptions regarding interest rate. So when, when the 3 year period ends and say this bond matures, you have to be reinvesting it in some other bond so you can feed in some interest rate assumptions. Uh, say this structure, uh, it, it gives out, uh, say, a semi-annual interest payout to the investors, say one percent. So, uh, so you can, you're earning this many return, but you're only paying out one percent. So, what it helps you to do is build a default cushion inside the structure. So, when defaults happen, you have a surplus against which that default can be given out. Yeah, and all these bonds say give quarterly coupons and have a bullet principle to be given. Uh, so what is really not of much importance is what what, what are the assumptions and those anyway uh, uh, doesn't make sense to really discuss out here. So you you have, you have say just some assumptions for interest rate. Say the that the bond will get reinvested at the same rate. Now in in case uh, you know without a simulator, this part will not have been there. You have your pipeline of investment, you have all your assumptions, and what you will do is you will you will you make a cash flow model. It's a simple cash flow model of say month one, month two, month three, up till month sixty. You under each of those months you have what are the costs, what did I pay out, what did I receive, and what is so and based on that you will have just one say one estimate for what the IRR for that investor might be, or what is the redemption premium? That say, if I put in hundred, what will the structure give me back? And now, but if you if you want to get an idea, if the investor asks, say, what are the what's the variability in returns? Uh, you just have to route all this information, not directly there, through a randomizer and then through a cash flow model. So in that randomizer, again, you'll be using all those estimates to make a binary variable default whether you are defaulting or not defaulting, the timing of default and say in this bond one goes but in the cash flow model to bond one investment will be written off. So we have assumed a recovery rate of 20 percent say at the end of the bond tenure some of the money comes down. Basically I mean uh, just theoretically what you are doing is instead of jumping from here to here routing it through a randomizer. Now the only thing that you have to do is simulate this, this structure for 10,000 times or a million times or whatever is your requirement. Uh, now that is where, uh, so uh, up to this, there is nothing Monte Carlo about it. You might be already doing this. Uh, uh, just the first is, it's a joke obviously, it's, the historic way of doing this would be, you know, I have a randomizer here. I, I have that. It's an I press F9. F9 will recalculate all the variables. I press F9. I get say X1 as the return. I jot it down somewhere. I again press F9. Again, this randomizes different bonds. Bonds default. Default at different timing, and you know, the investments accordingly change. Repayments change. Interest receipts change. Everything changes and. You know, I get X2 and I can keep on pressing F9. Obviously, uh, we can only do that for a certain number of times. You need something uh, which will automate this 
can go into Excel macros, but all of us cannot. We are adept at Excel macros. We are dedicated in software add ins. Uh, like it will SMB has the Excel add in. Otherwise, also, you have a lot of add ins available on the internet, free add ins which you can use, but uh, yeah, those are specific to a particular purpose. They might not allow you to uh, change your. So, this, this structure might be something which is very, very specific to you. So, uh, dedicated software add ins can only be of some help. Um, the, the other, the other uh, way of doing this would be uh, through a data table. I'm, I'm not sure if you're aware of this technique, but I'll just start uh, from this sketch. So, a data table, what it allows you to do is uh, we must have seen in Excel, yeah, if you have different scenario analysis, you can, do, you can do a what if analysis. And a third option behind the analysis is a data table. Uh, scenario analysis is very simple. What you're telling Excel, you are laying out the scenario and you're asking Excel to run that scenario. Again, now in, in our case, when, when, when you have different bonds, different default rates, different things happening, it's not possible to build a scenario which is you know, a very customized way of in Excel of uh, randomizing things. Uh, the other option is what if analysis, again, doesn't help us. The other is a data table. What a data table allows you to do is it allows you to, it it's basically puts the scenario of analysis in Excel and gives it a lot more power. So there are three kinds of uh, data table in Excel a, a column column input data table, a row input data table, and both a column and row input data table. So, what generally happens in a data table is say, uh, say you have, you, you just want to change only one variable. You will put the different values of that variable out here and you will you have out here a reference to your cash flow model. What are the things that you're interested in in say, the change? And if you run this data table, Excel will so whenever you have specified to change the values in your in your this structure, it will keep on changing that value and it will tell you say what the IR is or what this is, what that is. And now in in our case, we don't really need Excel to change any value. So the structure is fixed. All that we want. Excel to do is to just tactically press F9, F9, and just keep on pressing F9. And you know, it's like you are asking Excel to have a robotic arm to keep on pressing F9. So the way to do that is just put the number of trials out here. This can go down, can go go down to how many number of trials you want to do, and you can just link it with a dummy variable which doesn't form any part of your cash flow model. So what Excel then does is it comes to trial one, it replaces this value with a dummy variable. There is no change, but every time it comes from trial one, trial two, it basically recalculates every formula. And that's all that we want Excel to do because every time it recalculates, this changes, so you get multiple outcomes out there. Now, whatever values that you want to capture through each of those simulations, you can link it. What will then happen is you'll get a table which will have all these values filled across a number of trials. You can have what are the cash flows, number of defaults which happened, premium, IRR, what 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 was the value of that fund on on each of those months. And once you have this table with you, uh, you can get average, min max, you can get confidence interval standardization, and you can you can get your distribution of returns, distribution of redemption premium. So basically you have a set of data on which to uh, analyze your result. So, uh, if, if uh, we use this, this as a sample to uh, 10,000 times, it, it becomes uh, put in a structure like this. Even 10,000 trials take up to an hour to run. So, if you want to make it more, uh, if you want the estimation error to be less, you should run even more uh, simulations. Uh, now, when we did uh, this uh, simulation without correlation, we got an average IRR of 6.7 and a redemption premium of 28.8 lakhs. So, an investor is putting in 100 lakhs, is getting back 128.8 lakhs. The minimum IRR that uh, this analysis threw was minus 8.4%, in which case, the redemption premium is about minus 40 lakhs. So, you're putting in 100, you're getting back 60 lakhs. The maximum, that's the case where zero defaults happen. So, in, no, in, in case no defaults happen, that's the best case scenario. That's 9.3. The number of defaults average was about 
and we have maximum defaults of nine, including the three investments. With correlation, uh, now uh, Excel doesn't have when you use the RAND function in Excel, uh, it, it it draws independent samples. There is no inbuilt mechanism in Excel to draw a correlated uh, random number. So you can use add-ins. Uh, the most credible add-in would be from Kellogg School of Management has an add-in. You can just download an add-in put there. What it allows you to do is specify uh, Excel that draw random numbers but with some correlation. Now what, what happens when you do it with a correlated random uh, numbers is uh, the average doesn't change much within a redemption period. But you can see how the tail risk has changed. Now with correlation, the redemption period even goes down to 72.5 lakhs. So that's really putting in 100 lakhs, getting back only 30 lakhs. The maximum number of defaults shoots up to Google. So there's, there's, there's actually a case where all the this is the case where all your 10 bonds default. Along with that, you know, some reinvestments that you made, those also default. So, and if you look at the distribution of the number of defaults with correlation and independent defaults, you will immediately see that the width correlation defaults is actually accounting for contagion risk. So if you want to model a situation where the entire sector is getting pushed or some cataclysmic event is happening, the kind of so you need to use a distribution which has a factor gain compared to a normal distribution. So if you look at the independent default, it, it has a distribution. If you look at the width correlation, you see here it, it's it, its tail is fat both at this end. And also, if you see here, its tail is fat. So it's a fat tail distribution, and that's the reason why it's 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 showing more restrictive results because it's accounting for a uh, more worst case scenario. These are just some sample trial paths. So when you have your output for each of those months, you get what the value of your structure is. Uh, if you just graph it, so these are just about 150 paths. There are actually 10,000 such paths. But this, this is a good representation. So you can see started with 100 and it just models for you different situations and you get different cash flows. And again, uh, we started with uh, value at risk. You know, we have a portfolio of assets. How do I get a value at risk? Now, once you have all the redemption PDM and internal rate of return with you, if you just sort it out, take the bottom 5%, that's your 95% confidence limit mark. Again, in the case of no correlation, uh, you were able to communicate that uh, you know after meeting all the interest payments, the structure will at least give you back 2.3 lakhs. With correlation, this slowly again changes after uh, after meeting all the interest payments, the loss of principal did not exceed 11 lakhs. In the in in, in, in the remaining 5% of the cases, the worst case is obviously when it goes down to even uh, 72.5. Negative uh, this was an article which was debated a lot on um, uh, it came post the 2008 crisis and Monte Carlo Simulator is very much in vogue. It's used by established rating agencies for the investment time because the kind of structures, financial structures that they have. So obviously the question to ask is what well, if it's such a beautiful technique then why didn't it model for subprime like event? At least you would expect that uh, the bottom five percent of the events should have at least, or even if you are doing a million simulations, at least one simulation in that should have been able to capture the kind of meltdown which you saw in two thousand eight. Again, the standard answer to that is the problem is not with Monte Carlo; it's the assumptions that go into it. So, so when you change your You're using so that will give a true picture of the uncertainty that you are facing. Uh, so that's all the questions happy to ask. What would be such a further margin be input to because if you assume I'm not interested in portfolio. Yeah. And if you assume I'm not the whole start. The problem itself is analytically factual. But what I found out is uh, you have 
moral is very tough hmm. for most of the staff. Hmm. And uh, in assuming a normal distribution is not, I mean, I don't have the advantage, advantage of uh, Monte Carlo's intention. I assume normality for this. Yeah. So what's, what's, what's the way of So for a single stock, you are saying? Yeah, yeah, even for a single stock. If I have a model distribution, yeah. so what's the decision? So for a single stock, as you you don't need to have, have, a, have a simulator. Yeah, if I have a portfolio of stock, yeah. portfolio of stock, yeah. and if each of the stock is modeled as a normal distribution, yeah. and even four levels, yeah. then my risk of the portfolio is uh, analytically attractive. I don't need to do yes. But what uh, if I'm more interested in the scenarios where the normality is, uh, is non-existent. I mean, if, if, if that's a power law. <laughs> even in these stationary cases, for example, I, I, don't, I discard the 2008 period where people are not Then, then how would I? I mean, because that, that forms the real basis, the important sense it forms, forms the real basis. Yeah, so, I mean, so if I, if I so understand what would your... Suggest, what would you suggest for uh, modeling the input distributions from historical data? So, uh, if is it only a curve fitting for uh, with uh, histograms, two related histograms? Or? So if, if in, say if you have a strong reason to believe that something falls a normal, it follows a normal distribution. If, if say for a stock, yeah. so if you look at the historical values and if you make a histogram, yeah. it should confirm whether it follows a normal distribution or not. But if 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 for some reason you if you see a curve which is quite random walk, it, yeah. it, it it's really happens that it's it's again subjective. I don't have any clear cut answer to that. So the input distribution that you will use, yeah. and in fact. There are good resources which tell you, which have a very detailed, especially the Tamudar uh, Stern School of Business. He has a very good reference on, he has a complex decision tree as to, okay, will you observe this? Yes or no, if you observe this, okay, this. And at the end of the decision tree, is he suggests what kind of distribution you should be using. But the important thing is, even, you know, so one of, of the criticisms here is, you know, you are assuming that market returns. Fall along a bell shaped curve. Now, the reason this is, I mean, if you assume a normal distribution, you just have to estimate two parameters to get a distribution. And, you know, so even say if you follow some Poisson or whatever distribution, the onus is not that you have just identified the distribution correctly, you also have to identify the parameters for that correctly. So maybe my very amateur take on this would be use a normal distribution but with fatter dates. So, I mean, you're, 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 you know, you are free to just specify two parameters, but to account for a lot of variability, have a have fact dates.